As entrepreneurs, we always want to build great content to attract a steady stream of pre-qualified, pre-endorsed clients, to build that community who trust, who like us, trust us, and they really know us well. You know what? It's pretty hard to do. <laughs> I'm John Bowen. We're at AESNation.com, and I have an unbelievably talented, very remarkable individual who's been doing it over and over and over again, and he's been showing some of the most successful entrepreneurs how to do it. Please join me in just a second to meet the Chris Brogan. And he's going to share some inside secrets on how you can make great content and build a great community to serve them well. Stay tuned. Ordinary success? No way. You want amazing, remarkable, exceptional breakthroughs. Dig deep, think bold, drive hard, watch yourself soar beyond your dreams. AESNation.com. Chris, I am so excited to have you here. Uh, Dove Garden recommended, did an interview with Dove earlier. He's a marketing person I really respect and uh, have used his material, but I've been following you for an awful long time. You are a superstar making a big difference out there. So thank you for spending some time today. John, you're very kind. And one of the cool things about Dove is that now that I got introduced to him through another friend, I feel like all these people that I know and or should know are all hanging out together. So I'm glad I finally was invited to your party. Well, well, let's get started right away. One of the things, Chris, I, I wanted to do, we talked a little bit before we turned on the camera and I didn't ask you about your backstory. And what, one of the things that's so interesting, you know, when none of us get in, you know, wake up at three in the morning at three years old and say, hey, I want to be out there writing New York Times bestsellers. I want to, you know, share and write on a blog uh, uh, and, and have one of the most successful ones. Chris, tell me how you got to where you are today. It's, a, it's all crazy happenstance and mischief, I can say, John. I would say that uh, from the age of five, I thought I wanted to be an author. I was pretty sure I would write comic books uh, and science fiction type stories, and that didn't really happen. But along the way, uh, I've always really had a different view and approach of the universe. And my parents are both very loving people, are very loving people, and very supportive of different perspectives. And I would say that all the way back as far as, say, fifth grade, I started getting called into the principal's office office and getting in trouble because I just always had a different approach and I was questioning a lot of things, which is evidently really discouraged as a student. Although then when we were looking for innovative uh, thinkers, <laughs> yeah. we go, where are all the innovative thinkers? It's like that Picasso quote that I will ruin if I try to really quote, but he says, you know, I go into the classroom and I ask a bunch of, you know, eight year old kids who hears an artist, who hears a dancer, who hears a, a musician and all the hands go up for every question. And I ask a 17-year-old classroom that, and nobody puts their hands up, and it's like we're we're doing something wrong. I think that that's you know that's the spiritual backstory to who I am. What I really am is I I started in the, the telephone company world. I was in technology and in different ways. I started into a wireless telecom, and that was a a younger startup compared to the Ma Bell where I was. And that was probably my first glimpse of what entrepreneurship could be like, but I was just a desk monkey. I, I had no real right to be anybody. Um, but at that same time, I had, I had been blogging since way back in 1998 when they called it journaling. And I didn't do it because I thought I'd get rich. I didn't do it because I thought I would change the universe. I just wanted to speak my mind and I found a way to do so online. Um, flash forward to about 2005 or so into 2006, I had started a podcast uh, called Fat Guy Gets Fit. I thought I could do this podcast forever. Uh, as long as I don't get fit, I just had plenty of material. Uh, I co-founded an event called Pod Camp with a guy named Christopher Penn. And from there, I joined working with uh, Jeff Pulver, who's a visionary entrepreneur who co-founded Vonage way back in the day. And he was running some events. He hired me to do that. And since then, I've just really had no right to do anything I've done. I wrote a book with my friend Julian Smith. It became a New York Times bestseller. I've written seven more books since, and I'm working on my ninth. Um, I've consulted with all these cool companies, Coke, Pepsi, Comcast, Microsoft, Google, all the kind of companies you'd want to know. And in that experience, really what it boiled down to every single time was people just kept asking me, how do I 
get out on the web and make something worthwhile happen? And how do I prove to people that I'm who they want to work with? And, you know, what should I do now that I have their attention? And those kinds of questions. So I think what's really fun is that maybe the last 10 or more years, uh, the experience repeatedly, no matter what I'm paid and no matter in which format I'm doing it, and no matter if it's Coke or a solo guy, it's always the same sort of question, which is, you know, I get that all this stuff is happening on the web. I feel like I'm the only one not doing it, you know, well enough for myself. Now what? And it's been it's been a fun uh, puzzle piece to work on with people. John. Yeah, no, it, it is. And it's and it's pretty exciting. I mean, one of the reasons why I started AES Nation is it's kind of a mastermind group. Uh, I have the privilege through our mutual connections, you know, reach out to, uh, you know, superstars like yourself. And what happens is that most of us as entrepreneurs, particularly I'm, I'm 59 in my age group, uh, yeah, we've had some success along the way and we're, we're looking at this internet thing and I'm in Silicon Valley and I'm still looking at it and we're trying to figure out how to use it to really propel ourselves ahead. And, and I mean that in that, you know, we're, we're delivering, whether we're selling services or widgets, we've got a great client experience and, you know, certainly we're having some level of marketing success, but we're seeing some, you know, exponential growth available through the internet and Chris, one of the big challenges is, you know, you start diving in and, you know, there's just so many different outlets and platforms and whether you should create a platform and uh, whether you should be on Instagram, you know, I mean, I can go over, I probably could name about a hundred social media outlets right now. And, uh, and, and what I find is so many of the, the fellow entrepreneurs, they, they, they kind of, they get lost in it and, you know, they don't really make much of a commitment to it. And, you know, how, how do you help, um, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. H how do you help someone when they get confused with all this, you know, information and misinformation out there? It's, it's a beautiful question. It's amazing how many people are facing this in different ways. And I never allow anyone's age to be the, the uh, excuse because my good, uh, one of my people I admire a great deal, Tom Peters, is not exactly an especially young gentleman anymore. He is very active on the social platforms. No, he I've been uh, with Tom many times. I actually hired a few people away from him. So, uh, <laughs> Back in the and day. He, he is older than I am, but he is you know a great, innovative guy and uh, really out there still making no huge question. Difference. And Harvey McKay, uh, he just wrote a book, The McKay MBA of Selling in the Real World. And he was somebody I really admired from the 80s. And he reached out to me because he knew that I had some kind of access online. And he said, I don't know, I just think it'd be good if I were in front of some of the people that you know. And I thought, in what universe does one of my legends come to me and say, do you think we could talk to your community? I was like, please, I, whatever. Would you like to, my children? I'll rename one Harvey. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, no, it was a he, great he is uh, phenomenal, too. I've, I had the privilege of being on stage once with him and he is just such a gracious great guy let alone no question. providing no tremendous question. information we um I, I met him in person for the first time because i knew him online for a year or so but i met him this this last december and just as great behind the stage as he is in front as far as being kind and gracious so these people are all asking a lot of the same questions and it's basically i get it i know there's something going on out there and I, there's only so many hours in the day why should I be tweeting or something? And why are these things all named something stupid that you'd never <laughs> want to say to another grown up? Uh, blog is a dumb word. Tweet is a dumb word. Facebook. I mean, none of these things sound like something you could say at a country club, you know, without kind of rolling your eyes and looking at the ceiling. I get it. But there is something going on. And, and it's, it's much less weird and scary when you sort of strip away the tech. Because what's really going on is what door-to-door -door sales used to be. Do you know a guy who does this? Do you know a guy, you know, a person who, you know, does that? Except now the tools are just far more expanded. And now, you know, we don't have to be limited to geography. That's the only real big element that's changed. I was raised in Maine. And in Maine, uh, in my, my age, I'm 44, the conversations were Led Zeppelin versus Van Halen. It was Camaro versus Mustang. Uh, it was uh, either you liked the Red Sox or you were a jerk. And that was kind of it. And once you were done about four conversations, you were done. Like nobody had anything to talk about besides weather uh, or whatever we were all eating. And when I got online, you know, in the prototypical 80s online world, I got to talk about things I was interested in, scientific stuff, uh, 
fiction that you know no one else around me was reading, etc. And that's when I realized that if if you think of a good salesperson as someone who's really canvassing their geography, now all we're doing is canvassing our interests. So if you're an entrepreneur and you sell carpeting for private jets, it's a pretty niche, you know, kind of a thing. But you just got to start figuring out who's got jets that could use your awesome, amazing carpeting that's somehow better than whatever's stock inside the jet. That's what you start with. And I think that once people realize that, once people realize it's not all that weird, then you just have to start. I mean, you, you suddenly have these search tools that people used to pay tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars just sitting there. Because what these tools do for the average human is they allow us to just randomly throw stuff into the web we don't always know why we're even doing it, but then what happens on the other side of that random stuff that doesn't make sense is you and I can, you know, scour that and see what we get out of it, see what was useful. If someone happens to be saying, I'm just I'm buying a jet, what should I look for? Suddenly that carpet person says, well, I know what kind of carpet you should get. And there's a prospect right there. The only difference is that what's changed, I think, from the old days of selling is just because you know how to reach someone doesn't mean you've earned the opportunity to reach them. And I guess that's probably the biggest change. No, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, today I've had uh, conversations with you know, people in London and in Frankfurt and you know, it's just around the world. And it's so easy. The Internet facilitates that very quickly. One of the most successful webinars I ran last week was in uh, London. And, uh, you know, I didn't fly over there. You know, I was still in the States and so on. And it's just, you know, th that leverage in creating community. And Chris, one of the things that I, I thought would be great when we were talking before we turn on the cameras, uh, your new book, you know, it's not going to be coming out uh, for several months from the time of this recording. You're going to all want to get it. It's uh, uh, Belonging, a Framework for Embracing Community driving the economy and building the future. I, I, geez, I don't know any entrepreneur that doesn't want all of those. And Chris, you offered, you know, we're saying, well, what, where should we take this? Because you and I could talk about an awful lot of areas. And, and you were kind enough to say, hey, John, you know, I've, I've just, you know, I've got all this finished. Uh, it's really my latest thoughts on this and to share five of the key points. And uh, if you're still up for that, Chris, you know, I'd love to you know, dive in it with you. Sure. I mean, the very first of those that I that I pointed out uh, is to identify your circle. And when I say that, people, you know, we, we can't sell to everyone anymore. It just doesn't work. First off, the reason I called the book Belong is because I say that business is about belonging. And I, I say that the time for fitting in is over. Uh, Henry Ford said way back, you know, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. And that used to be, I mean, that was, that was, a technological wonder, the fact that he could mass produce something and they would kind of work a bit. Uh, but now we're, we're in the opposite of mass produced. And my children don't watch regular television. I don't have regular television. So I might watch some one show on Hulu, a movie on Amazon Prime and something else on Netflix. You're not competing with the commercials. I don't get commercials anymore. So how do you find me? So I mean, I like, you know, when you had Aaron on uh, from uh, FitAid and you were talking about, you know, these sports energy drinks back in, you know, a previous episode, what I liked is that you had this opportunity, he had an opportunity to reach a particular kind of community, like the CrossFit community. One of the people that I interview in the book uh, is the person behind Reebok's deal to also serve CrossFit. And what I liked about that experience was just that they found a circle where they felt like they could help out. They found a community where they knew that, you know, Reebok sneakers, CrossFit people are exercise freaks. This is a good fit. So they came and said, hey, we don't want to sell you any sneaker. We want to work with you on what kind of shoe would be the right kind of footwear for you to use in this sport. And I think that that's what, you know, we're starting to go after now. We're trying to find who are the people that we think we can serve with the product we've made, or if we like a certain community, how do we come up with what's going to be useful to them and how do they buy it? So it works for products. It works for services. I mean, as I asked just those two questions, I'm sure some people are going, oh, I never really kind of parsed it that way. I just figured I've got a list. I'll hit my list until someone buys. But it's really not good enough anymore just to hit everybody. It's, it's, you've really got to start to find out who can you serve and, and what are they actually thinking about? You know what I always like about this and uh... – is uh, Dan Sullivan of Strategic Coach, who's uh, a partner in a lot of the content that I'm doing now. And Dan talks about these kind of, t you wanna have a group that you wanna be a hero to and that you're passionate about. And, 
And we are so uh, ability to you know create segments in different markets. And if you go to uh, uh, it's Aaron's podcast is uh, episode eighty, and uh, I'd encourage you to listen to it because these are a couple of young guys uh, that started a company uh, without any experience in either media or uh, soft drink, but they thought they could do it. They found a couple of niches. And it's taken off like crazy. And they've, they've really leveraged everything Chris is going to talk about during this uh, podcast. So, I mean, this is, you can, whether you're just getting started or you're a really successful entrepreneur already, you can leverage this uh, so quickly. Uh, let's go, you know, the next one is find the edge. What are you talking about, Chris, when you say find the edge? So let's say, for instance, you're the Disney Corporation and you are, uh, grossly aware because Disney also owns Marvel, which uh, makes comic book characters, for instance. Disney is grossly aware of the fact that Japan's anime and manga business is really cutting into American people's taste of what they want to consume, both for you know comic books, which you think of as not a really interesting business, but also the movie business. So Disney, who is known for its Mickey Mouse and all that, makes a movie like Big Hero 6 which is based on a fairly obscure Marvel comic, which is sort of an American take on Japanese animation. This sounds so niche that it, like, you would never advise someone to make something this niche. And yet, uh, Disney was picking up new market segments who don't consider themselves Mickey Mouse fans, but who like that kind of a film. Disney also owns uh, ESPN. And you think about what they've done to grow the brand for sports, ESPN. Um, the fact that one of the best-selling movies uh, of, of 2014 was The Guardians of the Galaxy, which is a Marvel superhero movie that featured a raccoon in a tree, uh, that made more money than all the other superhero movies ever made. And so I think that when I say find the edge, what I'm trying to say is how do you find the kind of person you might appeal to who isn't necessarily some mass market, how do you learn their language? You know, when Aaron uh, talked to about FitAid, the, the labeling on the thing says paleo friendly. How many people on this podcast know what paleo means? But once Aaron knew, and once he knew that was important to the kind of person who's gonna buy that drink, he adds that to his lexicon. Aaron probably knows the names like Rich Froning and some of the other uh, greats inside of CrossFit that most normal humans don't need to know. But if you're going to connect with this kind of a circle, if you don't speak their language, you're going to look like the guy standing there on the edge trying to sell something, not the kind of person who's there to serve. And it's not a gimmick. You really just have to dig into it. When Emmett Scott made dental, dental work fun in your episode 56, it was all about what's interesting to a kid. And I'll tell you, what a kid wants is painless. They don't want anything to taste bad, and they, they'd probably like it to be as fast as possible. I'm sure they want iPad games to play with in the waiting room. That's what Emmett was thinking about. So to me, you're looking for how do I get into the shoes of the person I'm there to serve. It's not tricky, but not many people actually take the work to do it. Well, and that's, I, I think we're using Aaron as an example, and uh, it's a pretty powerful one because what he did is he saw the opportunity with uh, CrossFit, created a drink for them, and then uh, identified the influential uh, people there, the, you know, the key players, both male and female, and uh, arranged deals to promote and used a medium that guys like me don't understand at all, Instagram, which is one of the big things in CrossFit. And you, you listen to the podcast, and you'll hear some pretty big numbers of what they've been able to do over the last few years. And, you know, it's not unique to Aaron. This is in every niche. I mean, if you can find the edge, as you're saying, Chris, I mean, they, there's so much opportunity out there. And, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. You don't need everybody <laughs> to have a good business. Not at all. And, I mean, you can apply it to whatever you're into. I mean, just think of the things that you're into. You like golf. If I told you I did some work for Titleist, it was one of my first paid you know, uh, consulting gigs, I wandered in there and I kept telling people, look, my idea of golf is if I try to get it past the clown's nose, I might get the free pizza. <laughs> like you have the wrong guy. I don't, you know, I don't wear plaid willingly and those kinds of things. And they were laughing at me, but they said, you know, we're trying to kind of appeal to some younger users. We thought you might know something about that. I said, look, I was so bad at golf that my boss who took me to try to learn because he thought it would be what I should learn, stopped taking me. Like I, I, I hit what were called worm burners. 
But John, if I said to you, boy, you've got to see this driver, it will change your life or probably more so a putter because everyone knows that all the, all the fixes are in the short game. If I can make your short game better, you know, you're going to get a better score overall. We're going to have to I just yesterday I played uh, and had all new irons to be, get better at the short game. So see, spent exactly. a fair amount of money on that. So look, I don't know the first thing about golfing. I just spoke your language and made you light up a little bit. Now, if I had a golf club to sell, you'd be waiting to hear what I could tell you about it because I just got you excited about the thing you spend money on. That's the thing. We love to buy the things we love. It's the things that we're not really into that, that make it tricky. Now, let's go back to this thing. So first you figured out what your circle is. You've identified the edge or whatever you could do to be helpful. If the thing you sell isn't especially sexy, if you sell funerals, for instance, then the only other way you can do that is you can find what you both mutually love and then talk and connect through that. And then that's the sales angle. So when things like Instagram, what CrossFitters love is pictures of each other all sweaty after some workout, kind of showing off that they did a workout. It's the trophy. It is the dead fish on the wall. Uh, you know, it's the antlers. So this is photos. It's not all that weird once you think of it that way. Except that now Aaron goes, oh, so then if I take photos of people lifting weights with a can of my drink next to them and someone says, you know, it's actually pretty tasty or better still, I'm, I'm using this to diet and I feel really good about my energy levels, it's going to sell. And that's, I mean, that's all we're looking for is where are those well, You just said the whole campaign. <laughs> that's it. And this is, and this is where, you know, sometimes as entrepreneurs, we get so busy in our day to day, you know, we're. We're running the business and so on. If we can take a step back, and, and Chris, you're helping us do that, is take a step back and get clear. Okay, these are the people I want to serve. I want to be a hero to them. To find that edge that I can really make a difference. Boy, look out. Now, I want to go to the next is shine the bat single here. Communication, content, and connections. I mean, um, it's been a while since I've watched uh, Batman along the way. But it was one of my favorite shows, a little younger, and communication, content, and connections, those are three big C's. Those are all really important to me. So we show up at you know a place like CrossFit, just to keep using Aaron for a random example. It could be anything. We show up somewhere. We understand the edge. We understand the circle we want to serve. We know their language. We're pretty good at understanding who the bosses are and who we should be talking about and to. And we never want to talk to the top of this food chain, by the way, because they don't need anything from us. And what we're trying to do is help the aspirants you know, the people who are aspiring to get somewhere, how do we mm -hmm. help them get to that next somewhere? Well, then what we need to do is we need to sort of have a position. We need to have something we believe we can share with them and shining the bat signal in, the, in comic books, that signal would show up because the commissioner needed Batman to show up to help fix a problem. So that's me saying, if I put this here, will you gather, like if I give you something of useful. So your podcast is that bat signal. Your AES Nation, the blog, everything you're putting together is saying, hey, look, entrepreneurial friends of mine. I'm John Bowen. I, I get access to people you maybe don't. I've got some friends that have some neat ideas. I'd love to share them with you. That's the bat signal. So people keep coming back to it going, wow, I love when John has these interviews. I never know what I'm going to get, like that weird Brogan guy. And that's, you know, that's kind of what they're, they're looking for. From that, you're basically earning something when you shine that. Because if you're making helpful content, if you're making something that breaks a wall down somewhere, like if I said to you, did you know that if you just put about a half a handful of sand in the bottoms of the heels of your golf shoes, your putt is always going to be better. And if that were true, and it is absolutely not, if that were true. <laughs> See, I was were, ready to try it later this week here. I know, I know. I should have said, you know, I read there, you know, Tiger Woods said that's how he actually did his first seven years. Yeah. Uh, you would say, oh, and if I gave you that information for free, and if I gave you 90 plus percent of everything I did away for free, with really useful information that made you keep looking good to the person you need to look good to, your boss, your, your spouse, yourself, who cares? Then when I finally want some money from you, you're gonna be like, wow, Brogan has done so much for me. I should really see what this product is that he's selling because I feel like I've gotten so much out of all the other things. It's a basic psychological interplay, but it only comes if you shine your signal. You can't just show up. You can't just be the guy in the room. No one ever just says, I can't wait to talk to that person I haven't ever talked to before. It's like, do you have something to add to my personal picnic? So that's what the bat signal conversation is about. It's, re it's really basically content creation of some kind, newsletter, blog, 
podcast like this, anything that you feel like you can create on a reasonably relatively, uh, you know, a, a rolling signal or something like that, I think that you're, you're going to have a chance to, to earn something. And I think when people say I don't have time for this, that's always what blows my mind. Because I always feel, as an entrepreneur, in my mind, it's split into thirds, John. You're one-third prospecting, you're one-third executing on your business, and mm -hmm. you're one-third serving the people you've already got. If that is not your mix, and you're spending 80% of the time executing, or you're like, oh, I've got enough clients, I couldn't possibly take another client, and you're not prospecting, someone's leaving your business in the next two months, I promise you, and you're going to be like, ah, oh, I need a customer. That's what the bat signals for. You've got to keep some system going to prospect. Well, and, it, and it's and you know in today's world of technology, as you well know, Chris, because you've been leading on this, um, it's so easy to do. I mean, we're doing a podcast. I'm using maybe a couple thousand dollars of technology here to do this, and I'm doing three a week. I get the privilege of talking with someone like yourself. Who I would, I'd love to have the hour, hour or so, or thirty-five minute, forty-minute conversation. Anyways, I get to share it with thousands, tens of thousands of my friends, entrepreneurs, and it creates value that know, like, and trust. And and whether you're doing it in writing, and you you could, you don't have to be the uh, you know the writer. You can be the author. You know, your ideas and hire writers. I do that. I have about eight writers working with me to do this. It's always my thoughts and comments, but it's the ability. They, my English teachers would be proud of me reading this stuff because it's so much better. They're better writers than I, and I can be more, more out there. And you know, for the fellow entrepreneurs, you know, just picking one of these ways to shine that bat light is just so powerful. But let, let's go to the next, which is sharing as currency. You know, we hear the share economy and all this. What, what are we talking about here in sharing? So, I mean, you're, you're demonstrating it right now, John. So the, the couple of things we do after we make interesting content is we need to really connect that to some kind of community experience. Content consumed alone really does nothing nearly as good as a group experience. The reason Tony Robbins gathers everybody in a room and has them walk all over coals together is because they're going to talk for the rest of their life about, were you there? I was there. Do you remember walking on those coals? I remember walking on those coals. And it's there's no magic in walking on the coals. The, the, the magic is that you all were in the same room and you can talk about it later. There's an amazing thing you can do. You can do this anytime for the rest of your life. Anytime you're in a, a shared experience of any kind where something crazy happens that you just don't expect. And it could be you went to the theater. It could be you went to see Cirque du Soleil in Vegas. When you get out in the hallway, listen to how much louder everybody is. It's, it's this incredible energy. The, the volume is louder. It could be, I was at the Metropolitan Opera. Only went once. Uh, I watched you know, this opera, and, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. My girlfriend used to do opera, so you know, she was really into it. I was more like, I'm in the Metropolitan Opera. In the hallway, though, all these really fancy, very lovely people whose you know, watches cost more than my house were so loud because they were sharing the excitement of it. So in the sharing experience and what I'm talking about in this book, a lot of brands have started to get a lot better at making things more shareable in lots of different ways. Uh, movies have started doing this. When you ever go to a movie theater now, there's always some big plastic display of some kind that you see a ton of people taking pictures of each other in front of. And they think they're the first one who ever, like, I don't know, <laughs> put their head underneath the Incredible Hulk's fist as if he's punching them on the head. And they're so proud to share that with their friends. Like, it's the funniest novelty. And there's, of course, 200,000 other pictures like that on the web. But that, that sharing puts a brand next to you, the trusted human, in front of tons of people, which is basic advertising and endorsement without you actually really doing it. And so that kind of experience, shared experiences, hashtags, the Oscars now are more about the Twitter stream than it is about the show. It's almost like people watch the Oscars so that they can complain to their friends, not because they could care what movie was best. Um, you can go to a lot of different events I mean, look, the president of the U.S. takes selfies with, you know, Chancellor Merkel and things like that. There, there's, you think that this is a kid's game or that it's a, you know, a lesser human's game, but the rich, you know, Warren Buffett takes selfies, you know? So I've, I've, in my mind, if Bill Gates and Warren Buffett still stretch their phone out at arm's length and take a photo of each other and want to share this with people, there's something really base psychology about this. This is us putting our hand on the cave in Lascaux in France, you know, 100,000 years ago. It's not Twitter. It's not Facebook. It's, it's that human desire 
to say, I had this experience. Did you have that experience? And to me, he who takes that and does something with it, John, that's where stuff starts to happen. Video games right now are an $80 billion industry, whereas uh, movies are only a $20 billion industry. What do newspapers, which are old media, cover all the time? Movie box office openings. What's TV cover? Movie box office openings. When we look at video games, there are games out there right now. There's a game... Uh, Clash of Clans is probably not the one. It's one of these like you know games you get for free on your iPhone or something like that. It's pulling in a, th- a million dollars a day in gross right now, and so they can afford like ten million dollar ad spends for a free game where you, the only thing you might possibly pay for are in in game purchases. A million dollars a day gross. So to me. Sharing is part of that because once you get a great score, people share it on Facebook. Once they share it on Facebook, you see your friends playing a game that you think is dumb and you cannot imagine that they actually play on their phone. More people get the game. It's like a virus. It's the, it's, I, I loathe the concept of viral marketing, but I believe that in this concept of belonging, you know, if you're watching funny golf videos, I'm pretty sure you're sharing them, and that's where all this stuff starts to happen. Yeah, and, it's, and it brings a community together, whatever your tribe, community. Uh, it's a big deal, and this is we see it over and over again on uh, the social media and media. Let's go to the last point here and earning the sale uh, in the ongoing service. How's that come into play here? Uh, I put this at the last on purpose, and I and I think um, what's going on is that. Um, You've done all this work. You started to figure out the circle where you think you could be doing some business. You've uh, started to learn their language by finding the edge and talking to the people in it. That's market strategy, aftermarket research. The third thing about uh, shine your bat signal, that's content and event marketing. This is still real basic you know, terms if you strip off my crazy words. Uh, the connecting thing is uh, experience type marketing and it's, it's really kind of getting that community management process going. That last one, earning the right to sell, when Reebok approached CrossFit, they said, we'd love to talk to your people. Uh, we'd love to understand what you use the shoes for, how you use the shoes, what matters. Typical sneakers, typical running sneakers are very squishy. But when you're lifting weights, you need less squish because that changes the balance in the shoe. So you need really hard shoes that other people would not choose to wear to go for a couple mile jog. Now, CrossFit is a little bit of both. So they had to make it sort of a, a kind of in the middle. Uh, Spartan Race, which is another Reebok uh, brand, they had to make them so that they could eject water because there's a lot of mud on one of these obstacle courses. So when I ran the Spartan Race, I ran in the Reebok AT all-terrain shoe. And, you know, as we, you know, we'd try to run from one obstacle to the next, the, the shoes were spitting the mud out the sides to kind of clear and clean your feet up so you'd be ready for the next gooey mess. That's earning the sale was they sat with the the Spartan people. They asked them the questions. They said, is this good or bad? You know, and then when it came time to sell, of course people bought the shoes because they had input into it. Now you can put this for any product. You could sell insurance and do this. You could sell anything if you earn the sale by showing the people that you know what they're into, that you understand what their needs are, and you're not pushing something on them that they couldn't use. I used to work for Ma Bell, and I worked in repair service. And when people would call in and say, like, you know, my phone is my phone line is down because there's a hurricane, one of our jobs that they wanted us to do was try to sell them products. And I had this guy who sat beside me. He was the number one sales guy in the office, and I wanted him dead. Because all he ever did, John, was try to sell little old ladies things like, you know, three-way calling or a digital DSL service or something where you, you could high-speed data. It was a little old lady. She used the phone to, like, call her grandson. That was it. And he was selling whatever she didn't need. So he was the number one sales guy. But, of course, they canceled. They can't, you know, two months later when the son came and reviewed the bill, he'd cancel. There'd be, there'd be chargebacks and all that. He'd still get the pat on the back, but the company did get the revenue. We're entrepreneurs. We cannot afford chargebacks. We cannot afford churn like that. So we really have to earn the sale. So my premise is that all those four things I just said ahead of time give you the right to earn the sale and then gives you the right to keep the relationship going. Because unless you're selling one hamburger and that's all you have to sell in life is that one hamburger, you need the relationship. If you're a Callaway guy or a Titleist guy or whatever your brand is, when you bought those new irons, you're not sitting there anxiously waiting for the next set of irons you're waiting to see what this brand you support is going to sell you next. Uh, it's so true and so powerful. You know, these, uh, I'll come back to these, but let, let's, I want to change a uh, sure. segment. 
you are a prolific guy here, Chris, uh, in writing, and not only on your blog, and we'll come to that, but uh, book. And you know, we, we gave a little uh, tease for the new book, but you know, let me pull up the author's uh, page here for you, because I, I want them to see. So on Amazon, if you go to it, you've got all these great books. Uh, what, for our fellow entrepreneurs here today, what would you recommend they go to? to get a better feeling of all this right now? You know, I would say the book that probably speaks most specifically to you is the last major book I published, which was called The Freaks Shall Inherit the Earth. And it's a book about entrepreneurship. I said, I call it entrepreneurship for weirdos, misfits, and world dominators. And the, the premise was that when I see books about entrepreneurship, it's usually two white guys with ties shaking hands <laughs> across the table. And with red really and blue ties only allowed. Red and blue. <laughs> ties, red and blue ties, white shirts, blue, uh, blue or gray jackets. You know, it's like a clip art from 1983, and the only thing that changes is the hairstyle. Um, and what I wanted to write, there's a bunch of weird-looking bats all over the cover, which, by the way, is my secret language for the bat signal. Um, I wanted to attract people who maybe didn't think that they were a white guy in a business suit and a red tie, which, by the way, aren't horrible people. It's just all the other books are written for you. Let me just have one. And the people that I interviewed were from a lot of varieties of um, businesses that don't normally get covered. I, I interviewed Tony Hawk, the pro skater. And if you think about him as a skater, you're missing that he has a whole line of video games, that he has a whole line of attire, that he has all kinds of other endorsement deals with Mini, like the car company, Mini Coopers, uh, and all that. I interviewed Mark Echo, who started off as a guy airbrushing t-shirts. Uh, who has more than a billion in revenue through Echo and, uh, and his other brands and complex media. He's launching a TV network shortly. So these are the kinds of people that we, we kind of write off sometimes that are doing great for themselves and that have a very interesting kind of angle. A lot of what you and I talked about today is, is similar to what's in The Freaks. I'm just going to take a different swing at it because so few people caught you know, probably my bigger intentions. So I wrote the book to be helpful to people who were either established entrepreneurs or who had maybe given a go of it and were just getting ready to go back to their day job because maybe they felt like, maybe I just didn't figure this out. And I thought that that would be an interesting marketplace to serve just because there's so few people out there that encourage us in the right ways when we're having these entrepreneurial pursuits. And it's so easy to get horrendous advice because it just doesn't fit the cookie cutter of what's come before. No, Chris, I appreciate you doing it. And I did just download it so that I can uh, read it. I have not read it. But I'm going to go to the next segment and uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to do it because Chris is, everything I've read of Chris is just phenomenal and it's helped me be uh really uh, have some very uh, good success using these tools uh, many of you know that i've got a virtual business i'm in uh, global headquarters in silicon valley but it's a pool house and i have no employees and just uh it, it's pretty amazing what you can accomplish and those of you who have you know uh, bricks and mortar you know big business hey, you can leverage it even more Let's go to the next one, Chris. And this is the uh, phone application of the day. What would you recommend to our fellow entrepreneurs? Well, entrepreneurs, if you were an iPhone person, just block your ears for a minute because <laughs> this is an Android product. But for my Android friends who are forever left out, this is called Google Keep. Now, you can all look at it on your desktop at keep.google.com. Yeah. I'm going to go what? ahead and pull it up here so they could, so the iPhone users like myself can see what they could have had. <laughs> That's right. And again, you could use it on your desktop. Yeah. I also use it there. I mean, most any app I use has a desktop flavor to it. Um, and what it is, is think of it as almost like a little sticky notes. And the way I use it a little different than sticky notes is that I use it for things that I need to, to repeat as a process every day. So for instance, if I, if my goals are to, I don't know, drink eight glasses of water and run five miles a day and make sure I follow up with five prospects every single day. I keep all kinds of notes there. I also keep little notes to remind myself of my theme for the week and my theme for the month because I'm, I'm forever finding that people put their mission out there in some way like, you know, this is the year I'm going to crack two million in sales, somebody will say. And then they'll wait till about December 29th and go, that's weird. I didn't make two million. And what I like to tell people is that your day is your week, is your month, is your year. And, you know, a million a year is 84,000 a month. That means 22,000 a week. If you don't have some sticky note somewhere, and that's what I use Google Keep for that, 
I have that 22,000 a week sitting there to remind me that that's a million. So if I didn't make it, I can make the course correction this next week, not 11 and a half months from now. No, oh, that's great. And let's resources here. And uh, with resources, what I want to do is I'm going to pull up first. Uh, I want to go to your website, Chris, but I'm going to pull up the Alexa thing because uh, this is a nice resource. I like to just track my websites and different properties I have. And there's something like 17 million, I think, websites in the world. They, uh, I, I put one up one time, Chris, and uh, it said 17 million. So I'm hoping maybe there was at least one or two below me. Uh, but one of the things that I really respect about Chris is he, he's actually doing it. You can go down and see the statistics and so on. But I mean, rank in the U.S. of 29,000. And I'm going to go to the international part, too. And you can see that, you know, he's a player all over the world. And the reason for that is I want you to take advantage of his resources. Chris, why don't we, uh, let me pull up your uh, website here. And why don't you tell us a little bit about, it's got, uh, it's opening up with a dialogue box, get my best work sent free. What, what are they going to get there? And then maybe we can point out some of the other things on the website. So I write a newsletter every week. I deliver it on Sunday and uh, a little different than most newsletters. It is not my junk drawer. I was a little envious earlier when you were talking about your eight authors. I write all my own work and I was thinking, boy, maybe I should do that someday. But I'm, I'm an well, fool. You, ha you haven't all. read any of my writing here. The it, time it takes me to write versus the time it takes you to write. Uh, my writers get it done in about a quarter to a fifth of the time. So it's a lot more efficient. But uh, yeah, I get that. And, and you know, some people writing is not their thing. And I've, right. I've talked to CEOs where they've said to me, I don't want to blog. I can't pause. I can't even barely write a sentence. And I say, great. Can you talk into a camera? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Great. Can you talk into an audio machine and just record a sound bite? Oh, of course. Can you take a photo of something you thought was interesting? I mean, there's tons of ways to make content. So I write a newsletter every Sunday it comes out. It usually has some kind of a business premise uh, about something tied to belonging in some way right now, which could be, I might, I mean, this last week's issue is about how to have uh, mastermind groups everywhere, how to have little mastermind groups. And I, I use an app on my phone called WhatsApp and I keep little tiny groups of people going and it's, it's like group messaging. Basically you can do the same thing on Facebook if you want. Um, besides that, there's a bunch of different types of courses that I offer. Um, and they're, they're all basically digital. They're all mostly email delivered with some video and other components. And why I started putting together courses is because my consulting business for a long time was just the big guys. And I like that, except that what's different between entrepreneurs and the big guys is big guys may or may not do something and they may or may not do it 13 to 18 months after we talk about it. Uh, and I like their paycheck. That's, that's very nice of them. But I like it when people actually do something interesting. And like with your AES Nation, it's really a lot of people that are looking to try things and take ideas and, and run them in the field and see what happens. And that's who I'd rather serve. So that's why I started making stuff that was a lot more affordable to, to human beings. Well, no, great. And, and you're doing an excellent job. I encourage everybody to go to the website. And let me kind of bring it all together key takeaways. And, you know, at AES Nation, we're all about executing. It's about accelerating your success so that you can do even better by serving people well, your community. And I'm going to start out with what Chris started with first, identifying your circle. What is that community that you want to serve passionately? You want to be a hero to? Find the edge, you know, get clarity around the niche, you know, that edge there that you can really be a player. We don't need all 7 billion families or 7 billion individuals in the world. Shine the bat signal. I've never heard that one before. Communication, content, connections. You know, this is all about, you know, really letting people know what you have, creating that content, that event marketing, attracting that steady stream of people from the community that you want to build. Sharing as a, uh, Currency. I mean, this, there's so much power in sharing, uh, you know, joint experiences. You know, we're all in this together. It's amazing the, the power of bringing together groups. And, and then, you know, it's the no like, and trust. The very last, earning that sale and that ongoing experience. And we've got to, we've got to understand what their needs are, but then deliver that as part of the community. 
and then keep that relationship. Chris, this has been extremely valuable. I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, if you missed anything at all, you can see the show notes at AES Nation. There's a transcript there as well, and we've got a whole bunch of other goodies too. So make sure you, if you're watching anywhere else other than AESNation.com to go there. Chris, thank you again and continued success. Remember your clients and all your future clients, they're counting on you. Don't let them down. Exceptional, remarkable breakthroughs. AESNation.com.